A Girl and a Gun, episode 11, recorded on the 13th of June 2013. Party rap. <laughs> Hello, welcome to A Girl and a Gun, the show for filmmakers and content creators. I am Phil Moore, and as always, I'm joined by John Mazels. Hello very much, Phil. Hello, John. And uh, hello, everybody. And as you can see with our wonderful open, we, we, we're in party mode we at are. the moment. We are. Because this is the last show that this particular group of students are going to be doing with us. It's the end of semester. And this is really good because being the last show, they can do everything they possibly can to get it wrong. Where am I looking? <laughs> am I oh, I'm looking at that one. <laughs> um, so that, uh, there's going to be lots of unusual things happening in this show, We're trying I think. everything. We're going completely for broke, which is what you should do in an exercise. And Veronica's like dressed up as well. Yeah, oh, fabulous, fabulous. She's party gear. And look, I was, I was going to be coming in here on Skype uh, you know, it's just Murphy popped Yeah, we in. said last week you were going to be in America. We did. Well, I got the date wrong. I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> Maybe next time uh, we'll Maybe. get you in via Skype. We, we actually tried to do that, get that set up, and we're having technical glitches. I've got to talk to the guys at Twit and find out how the hell they do it because we could not get it working do today, the, could the we? Twit thing? At, at Twit.tv. Well, look, there's something that you learn, which is if, if you do this the same every week, and you don't change anything, then you can make it work. But you yeah. know, when you We don't. have the issue that other people use this studio and things get changed around on yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got a lot to get through, so let's start with the breaking news of this week. <laughs> and this has been a huge week. For breaking news. For breaking news. Mm. On Monday, US time, um, we small hours of Tuesday, our time, um, there were two major events happening. One is the E3 show, which is games where Xbox One was uh, launched for gamers. We already had an announcement of that a few weeks ago. Um, and the PlayStation 4 mm. was also announced. At the same time as Xbox were doing their thing, Apple were doing the keynote speech at the WWDC conference, the Worldwide Developers Conference. And they're talking about the next version of iOS. iOS 7 was and, a big deal. And the new Mac. And OS X was mm. a big deal. Um, but we're not going to talk about those. Of interest to our audience in particular, was the release of the, a new Mac Pro, a new Mac Pro desktop. Um, it was talked about a while ago that there would be a new Mac Pro. There we are, there's the website there. This is what it looks like, it's the iBin. <laughs> so, I mean, it really looks like an oversized cigar case. It's about a third of the size of the old Mac Pro, so it's quite small by comparison. It's, as you can see, cylindrical. Yeah. And uh, if you scroll, yeah, just keep showing that and I'll talk through it. There's a... Uh, it's a really innovative design, uh, and that's a big deal for them, of course. The whole thing is built well, around a, a central core. It's a big deal that core. it's innovative design. Well, from Apple, because you, you would argue they haven't done anything truly innovative since uh, the iPhone and the iPad. Yeah, but if you compare what Apple does, for instance, to, to what has happened in the Intel Windows world, we're still looking at laptops and, and desktops that look substantially the same as they, they did in the early days. In t um, uh, Apple at least has gone through some things that look like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> well, th th this is a very new design for a desktop computer, basically, which is what it is. Uh, it's all built around this central core. Um, it, it, does, it has internal um, flash drives, so there is no spinning hard disk in the thing. So it's knockover proof. Yes. So it's using, um, well, they call it flash drives, but actually it's solid state drives. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 12, up to 12 cores of processing, 40 gigabits of PCI bandwidth. Um, they claim two times as fast as the older Mac Pros, the old um, cheese cutter ones. Um, the only standard thing in this box really is the, the RAM, the memory units, they, send, they seem to slot in in a normal mm. way. Um, up to 60 gigabits um, a second, a gigabyte a second of memory bandwidth. Uh, two times more than the older Mac Pros. You know, it, it's, it's a funny thing when you look at this. The, it, it's, it's quite often that the form follows function. Um, if you remember, and Phil, you're old enough, 
to remember <laughs> back to what we would have called the supercomputers of the 1970s. And the big supercomputer in those days was the Cray. Mm. And in order to get the speed, they had everything arranged around a solid core. So they had everything fanning around this cylindrical thing. And um, you could actually sit on it. It was like looking at a circular couch. Yeah. But the circular form... So this is a mini Cray. Uh, it, it could <laughs> be. It could be that, you know, for all we know, that the well, the basic idea is that the the, the, um, the, the vent uh, sucks up from the bottom, blows out the top, so all of that um, uh, heat control is happening through the centre of the piece. I know, <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's cooling everything around it in a circular fashion, uh, rather than spinning around a, a metal box. Everything old is new again. Everything old is new again. Mm. Uh, look, I was quite excited when I first saw this. It, it's a really impressive design. Uh, obviously, design is ruling this rather than the engineers. The, th the one thing that concerned me, I must admit, is the GPUs. It has two dual GPUs, in it, or, or uh, dual GPUs, up to seven teraflops of computer power. Look, they're very powerful, they're very high end, but they are AMD Fire Pro workstation class GPUs. Nothing wrong with them. However, for those doing video work, NVIDIA with their CUDA cores has become pretty standard for the kind of GPU you want to be using. Adobe's Premiere Pro and After Effects use it, um, and as do other programs. And this is where they're writing code that goes directly to execute on the Exactly, so they're, they're talking directly to the GPU core and NVIDIA's CUDA cores were the ones that set that up. Um, so that was, has been a concern for some people in the video world, and this is clearly designed for video professionals, mm. this machine, video and audio professionals. Um, the other concern is that uh, there is no internal hard drive. Everything is through uh, Thunderbolt 2 expansion ports or USB 3. Uh, and it also has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, of course, built into it. I don't think that's a major drama, though. It's becoming pretty standard to expand a box like this mm. with Thunderbolt 2, and certainly fast enough for that kind of thing. We talked about this at the NAB show a few weeks ago, mm. that Thunderbolt's really coming to the fore. And there you can see the ports there on the screen now. And they, they made a big point of the fact that when you rotate the thing around, they will light up for you. Although, see at the bottom there, that's the power cord. There's it's no power cord plugged standard, in. Standard, standard. Imagine gun. turning this thing around with the power cord actually plugged in. It's not going to be that easy, to be honest. Yeah. But it'll light up for you in any case. Love the thought. So there's a power. There's, a, there's a, an on button. You can see that. Yeah, and so there's the on the button on there. Screen. stuck down at the bottom there. Um, look, I think it's a really interesting design. Uh, it's a slick shiny black is going to get fingerprints and dust. Mm -hmm. My concern is that it's at the top it's got the air coming out. It's quite quiet apparently, but it's, it looks like a bin and things are going to get, people are going to put stuff in there. They're going to leave stuff in the top, they'll put thumb drives in there, just somewhere to store it, and it'll become a little garbage heap of all sorts of things on top of that fan. You reckon? I reckon think of, people are going to put stuff on the top of it yeah. and it'll clutter it up. Uh, but the, the fan's blowing up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it just, <laughs> you, know, you put stuff on top. Would you put? Would, just... would you? It looks about this big. Yeah. For the measurements. Would you put this under your desk, or would you have it on the desk beside I'd you? Put you it do on you the think? top of the desk. On the top of the I'd desk. I just wait. I wait for the aftermarket attachment that allows me to have the warm air coming up through the core to continue. It's your coffee heater. Coffee. That's what it is. It's yeah. your coffee warmer. Um, the great thing about this with Thunderbolt Two is you can connect up to three 4K displays. So this is ready made for 4K uh, workflow. Mm. Three 4K displays, and we have a, right. another product coming up, we'll talk about it later, that actually helps to enable that. Look, I like it. Um, the main concern I had with it, as I said, was it didn't use NVIDIA, it was using AMD. Um, there is another story here, which I found, however, from Phil Fodgett, uh, a blog here, where he, uh, Phil Hodgett, I should say, sorry, I'm reading the, the Phil title Hodgett's one. blog. Philip Hodgett's blog. You can understand why you get that wrong. Exactly. Stop the CUDA panic, he says. Adobe CC, the new Creative Cloud, resolve all of these will work fine on the Mac Pro and they will work with this because, right. uh, and as he points out here, since everyone was using the NVIDIA um, CUDA cores, it was because OpenCL and other, other formats weren't working. Well, OpenCL is pretty much working now and that will work with these AMD chips as well. So. I think everyone's going to get up to speed with this. This looks like a really serious machine for video professionals mm, and everyone sure. will make sure that they work on this properly, no doubt. Uh, so that's not a big issue. If you want to find out about, more about that, it's on philiphodgetts.com. Uh, he's got a blog there that talks about that. Uh, and it happens to come, as a result, the very same week, this week, June 10th, is the anniversary of the Apple II. 
In 1977. Wow, the <laughs> archetypal garage device that they thought they'd never sell a lot of. Mm, and here we are, what, 36 years later, whatever it is, yeah. um, and they've just released a new Mac Pro. I was really concerned that they were going to give up on the Mac Pros because they're doing so well with the portable devices. I was really concerned that the last generation, which wasn't much of an upgrade, mm. uh, as powerful as they have been, is like, it's been so long between lunches with, with these machines. Like, are they going to drop them completely? Now, now, for people like me who are completely Mac illiterate, which part of the Mac architecture is this upgrading? Is this upgrading from the, you know, the flat screeny things that have everything? There's no screen on this, so you've got to add your own screens. Right. Um, As opposed to the ones that were no, like yeah, the all-in ones. Not, that not the going. iMacs, which is what this thing is here yeah. in front of us there. That's right. an iMac. This is the Mac Pros like we actually have in our editing suite in the other room. Okay. And, um, and the one that's actually running in our on, control on room. To which you would add a exactly. screen and a which you add mouse a screen. and a keyboard and a cup of coffee. Exactly. So these are the new Mac Pros. Um, I think they're an exciting change. They won't be released until later this year. Mm. They've announced them. We don't know the price yet. They're going to be expensive though. I can guarantee you they're going to be expensive. And I don't know what expensive means just yet, but they will be expensive. But if you're serious about it, you'll spend it, the money. It's so funny. There we, you are. The, the, we we used to <laughs> think that... That's the orange version. The orange version. <laughs> we used to think, you know, that to get a really good laptop, you'd have to pay 6,000 bucks. And indeed, I did with my last laptop spend that much. And the, the same amount of power now is, is down around the $2,000 price point. Mm. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Not only do the manufacturers have to come up with something that's faster, better, but they've also got to come up with good justification for you to go back and spend. How much, well, how much do you it. think this would cost, this new Mac Pro? I don't know. If I said like six thousand dollars, do you tell me to come on I was on thinking down? about six. I was thinking about six, but then you've got to add a monitor, add at least one good-sized external hard drive. Mm. Um, if you want to add Nvidia cores, you can add them through the Thunderbolt as well. You can get a you know a it's PCI like bridge. A car, isn't it? You know, there's the machine. But if you yeah. want to actually take it out on the road, you also there's need, a lot of extras you'll have to add to it. So I'm waiting until the four-door version comes out. Okay. <laughs> um, the other big news this week was uh, um, the Xbox One. Uh, released for gamers and the PlayStation 4. Now, Xbox was released in the morning, um, in New York time, uh, uh, American time, and the PlayStation was later that afternoon. Uh, now, the Xbox announced their price. It's going to be um, $499, $500 US. No, it's dollars Sorry? $499. we have got kibitzes coming from the floor here. The Xbox One. Do I hear anything above $599? I hear $599. Do I hear $699? $699, $699 no, no. going once. This, this one of our computer geek students here. I, I understood it was four ninety nine, and the PlayStation was coming in at three ninety nine, four hundred dollars. Well, that's in America, yeah. That's in America, I'm talking American yeah. prices. Yes. Look, look. In two weeks, I'll come back. I'll do a complete report, <laughs> uh, and we'll know exactly how much it's really now, worth. Th there are heaps of shows, heaps of podcasts out there. Gonna, there you are. <laughs> There's Nick. He's being our um, floor manager today. It's his fault. <laughs> it's his fault. It's, com it's completely his fault. Um, heaps of shows are going to be talking about these as gamers, for the gamers. I don't want to talk about that. Let them do that. My concern here for our audience as games creators, as content creators, is actually developing games and content for these boxes. Uh, the PlayStation 4, aside from undercutting the Xbox One on price, they have some really good exclusive titles. Um, they also have always had a really strong focus on indie games. Mm. Smaller, independent, cheaper to make kind of games. Uh, and they really made a big push for that in their launch as well. So that looks to be great news for um, people developing for the PlayStation 4 in particular. Plus, one of the big problems with the Xbox One was uh, the way that they're going to try and monetize off um, secondhand and uh, um, sharing of games. Uh, PlayStation 4 said, no, no, we're going to do that. If you want to share a game, just give it to your friend, they can play it. On the basis or, or, or already, sell a second paid, hand and just you, sell You paid for it once. Yeah, pay for it once and do the, the old fashioned way. I so hope we don't go back to the the, the early 80s thing of, of this DRM that was just uber restrictive mm. and horrible to deal with. In Microsoft's defence, they're thinking more of games now going off disk and being online downloadable, yeah. which is true. PlayStation was focusing on if you buy it on a disk, you can share it, you can take it to a friend's place, all of that kind of stuff. The way you do now, we're not going to try and restrict any of that uh, because uh, Microsoft's approach seemed a little bit uh, uh, heavy-handed, basically. Uh, the one wrinkle in the PlayStation 4 announcement was that they are now going to charge for online multiplayer network gaming. Mm. 
but it's only sixty dollars a month uh, a year. A year. A year. Whereas Xbox Gold membership is like a hundred dollars a year anyway, so it's so still you can cheaper do a than Xbox. Yeah. Mm. So if you're developing games, and in terms of architecture, they're both Intel based. Now these new platforms are both Intel x86 architecture, similar to a PC. Mm. So if you're developing for PC games, it's the same basic architecture for either PlayStation 4 or Xbox One. You develop once and you just put it out to all of them. Right. That is good news for developers, frankly, no matter which platform. And people are going to, gamers are going to buy both of them anyway, frankly. They'll buy both of these units eventually. Really? Serious gamers do. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And the other big, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> the other big news for these, in particular the Xbox One, but also partly the PlayStation 4, is going beyond games and talking about t TV and movies and um, music and you know making it an entertainment unit, more right. broadly speaking. Yeah. That was Microsoft's big push for the Xbox One. PlayStation did a bit of that. They, in fact, got their representative from Sony Pictures to come in and talk about all the shows that might end up on it which never happens, those two sides of the company are at loggerheads usually. So they're trying to put up a good front. They did a really good launch. PlayStation 4 did a really good launch, very impressive. Um, I think it'll do better over this Christmas season than the Xbox One. And you know, you've got to be expecting that Sony's going to be putting a lot of store into the uh, PlayStation platform because that's really their cash cow right now. Everything else, they're... Uh, they're competing on, well, on, on boxes. We had, I don't know if we did the story, was it last week, the week before? The big money maker for Sony is insurance. They Seriously? sell in, in, insurance in Japan. Not TVs, not PlayStations, not any of this entertainment stuff. Insurance? It's insurance. What type of insurance? Like somebody isn't going to come and steal your game? No, 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 just regular general, you know. Household insurance? Household insurance, that kind of stuff. In Japan in particular. Your house is safe. It's a Sony. Uh, this is, all of this is Cost them money. And in fact, to sell this for about $400 or 300 yeah, $400, mm. I bet you it's a loss leader for them. They're going to lose money on this. They're going to lose money because they're not trying to monetize the sharing. They're going to make a little bit of money back on the networking now from the PlayStation Network, and right. that's fair enough. But they're, they're selling this at cost, if not less, to try and get people back onto the PlayStation 4. It's a strategy. It's a strategy. It works for supermarkets. Yeah. Um, Next, Sony will be selling. Good news for game developers either way. <laughs> Uh, going to either Xbox One. So come this Christmas, New Year, this Christmas uh, and New Year period, uh, they're both going to be out there and people are going to be buying them. And there's lots of great new games coming. They look awesome. The games that were shown off for these yeah. platforms looked awesome, seriously. Significantly better than the ET game we featured last week? A little bit better than A that. Bit Even better. better than that, yes, absolutely. Uh, but we have heaps to get through. Uh, what are we looking at there? We've got, uh, there you are, Xbox One. I didn't see that. What was that again? Let's have a look at that again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there, there's Xbox One from E3, and there's, there's a, a comparison of them. Are we able to hear the audio? I didn't see what this video was. He's talking, Phil. He's saying He's words. Words are coming out of his mouth. I think they're going to come out and just try them both and see which one I like better. I think that Xbox tried to play the Steve Jobs Apple yeah, dice, and they lost, so we'll see how that goes for him. My God, so she's articulate. Yeah. So there it says, Xbox One in the shops November, priced at four ninety nine. Yeah, oh, that's the US uh, price. I don't know what that Australia's. Is, that is get. just that is one of the most <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> People get excited yeah, about their do. games. Uh, anyway, let's move along to other things. Because we're so much more articulate here, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. We're saying all kinds of things that we don't really. Um, cameras. We love talking about cameras here. Mm -hmm. uh, and. After having Pete DeVries on last week, we talked a lot about the Canon 5Ds again, uh, the DSLR range. Uh, just quickly, there are new enhancements to the EOS range, which includes the 5Ds and 7Ds. Um, firmware upgrade to enhance the AF performance um, and new lenses, wide-angle lenses. The lens everybody's, in the, like the two lenses everybody's sort of raving about. Mm. Yeah, so the lenses sound really good. In fact, we've got another piece here related to that. Um, Able Cine have done a comparison of some, some of the, the more recent, uh, the Canon Compact Cine Zooms. Uh, and actually sh the, the clip here showing them rather than just talking exactly. about them. Exactly, so there's a really nice comparison. Yeah. I don't know if we have that queued up, but can we show a little bit of that comparison there? Just jumping in the middle of it somewhere. This is from ablecinecom.com, where they compare the two Canon Compact Cine Zooms, the 15.5 to 47 millimetre and the 30 mil to 105 millimetre. Yeah, just jump in the middle because they do a bit of an introduction to begin with. Which is always boring. Who wants the, the ads? 15, to well, they can, there we go. Yeah, so it's 20 inches. Look how small it is. But the short focal length means that the frame isn't quite as tight. 
purpose of this test is a classic stand-up situation. We're doing it here in our showroom where Naomi is sort of posing as a host or reporter uh, in the environment in which she's speaking, and we want to be able to show the like range that you can get <laughs> on our reporters. two different lenses at given distances. Right, so I've actually got a, a standard Again, situation with, where they can test range. hair color Going and skin tones and backgrounds, and they're using the standard closer. lenses to do this. Well, I can certainly see she's got hair color. Yeah. And Naomi look at that depth of field. It went absolutely in a zoom lens. Thin. Wafer thin. The depth of field in a zoom lens. Sometimes. <laughs> to what speed and here's uh, this. I presume is the other lens. Yeah. So that's and this will zoom in there. Similar zoom. So really interesting. Got some nice zooms now for the the Canon EOS range. Hmm. Um, more cinematic wide angle lenses. Great. But um, it's certainly it, holding nice sharp focus as it, as it goes in. It is, yeah. which is, can be tricky on a really tight zoom. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to see that in the whole, that's on ablecine.com, uh, that comparison there. Let's move along. Um, you're going to be talking now about the, the camera piece and Erica Addis. Is that up next? Yes. Yes. Um, who pulled together a discussion of life after the Canon 5D, 7D. Um, and had some really nice things to say in this article, uh, particularly about the Blackmagic design camera, which she says is just taking the, the world by storm. Mm. She thinks that's absolutely fabulous. And she goes on, you sort of read down through the article, um, goes on to talk about Pete DeVries, who we had on last week, and how um, yeah. you know, his, his experience shooting with a C300 uh, in Europe. And so yeah, this you know, was part C of C three hundred is really becoming the camera of choice in the doco market. Yeah, yeah that, which is what Pete says. This is part of an Ausdocs panel that she ran, and Pete was part of the documentary filmmakers. That was, yeah, and he talks about that, which he did with us last week. He also talks about the F um, fifty five, which he mentioned last oh, week as well, uh, similar to the Red Epic. Um, and they also had John Brawley, who's one of the experts, as you mentioned, on the Black Magic design, the Cine Pocket Camera who I still want to get here as a guest to talk about the new Black Magic Ranch. We haven't we, had a chance to get really him in. We really do need to do that. You can just look forward to that happening. In a, we in almost got him a few weeks ago, but we, it, we just couldn't get the timing right, unfortunately, because it was so busy. Mm -hmm. But next time he's in town and we can do it um, next semester, we'll try to get John Brawley in. Uh, but yeah, a really good um, breakdown of these new fairly budget professional cameras and how they're being used for documentary filmmakers in particular. And it's amazing that the, you, you look at the price point for cameras that are being used now to shoot high def and higher, and these are cameras that are costing anywhere from under a thousand bucks up to thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. Mm. But all of them turning out pictures that you just have to regard as exemplary. And I guess the difference is as you pay more money, you get more features. Like the the very fully featured cameras that we use in the studio here, um, which could turn out the same high definition well, they, picture they, as, as, say, a GoPro, mm. but you're not going to do the same things with a GoPro. Well, these cameras are actually Panasonic P2 format, mm. and there's an in this, in fact, uh, uh, Randall Wood pointed out that he's been shooting with a Panasonic P2 format uh, using AVC Intracodic, which is one of their, the Panasonic codec, um, and they're, they're $4,000, the, the higher-end ones. But, you know, uh, these were meant to be ENG-type cameras. Uh, they're not really meant for high-end cinematic stuff, but they they look great. They can look EMG great. EMG is electronic news gathering, just in case you didn't know. For those who didn't know, yeah, thank you very right. much. Um, so check out that article. That's on. We found that on Screen Hub. Thank you, Screen Hub. Uh, new cameras, experts pour over the latest budget range. Mm. That's from Erica Addis. Um, going back to the uh, the Apple Mac Pro, and I mentioned it's got this uh, the Thunderbolt 2. Where everything's got a plug-in via Thunderbolt 2 these days, if you can. Well, one product that makes that easy to use, Blackmagic have just announced a new dropped price for their Ultra Studio 4K. And, and a, a camera that does just everything. Well, this, this is the rack mount unit, hmm. sorry. This, this is not the Blackmagic camera. Oh, oh, you're talking about the, the thing? Yes, yeah. I'm talking about the other thing. The other thing. The other thing. <laughs> the other thing. <laughs> this is the rack mount unit that enables 4K workflow, um, uh, HDMI, uh, 6G, 6G SDI input and output yeah. uh, for 4K. Uh, so you can plug your monitors into that and you can, you've got all... So this will enable that kind of workflow using something like the new Mac Pro when it comes out. So that's the perfect um, accessory for that, basically. Uh, they've just dropped the price on that. I think... Um, and I'm trying to find, find where the price actually is in this article. It's not quoting it to me. <laughs> no, it, I couldn't see it when I looked at that article either. But what I do find really amazing is that we're starting to bandy around the terms like, uh, you know, 6 gig SDI, mm. as though <laughs> it's just totally commonplace. 
And video has always dealt with these amazingly fast rates. And so at the time when 100 megabit Ethernet was like, that was the ant's pants. We're going from 10, 10 megs to 100 megs in the IT world, and they're going, oh, it's 100 megabits, we're going to be really crappy. Uh -huh. It was like yeah. the video world, we've been doing 270 megabits for yonks. Well, now we're doing six gigs. You're starting to show your age, John. Whenever, we st whenever the old farts like us start talking about, well, in the old days it was like this, and isn't there one, you yeah, know. Yeah, when I was growing up. These guys don't even know about that. It's like, oh, this is normal. <laughs> this is normal for them now. Um, there we are, there's the Ultra Studio. You found a picture of it, thank you very much. I couldn't find one. There's the Ultra Studio there for our Thunderbolt computer. Um, Thunderbolt obviously is mainly for Macs. Are, are there any PCs that are loose with Thunderbolt? Um, it's, it's a Mac thing. It is, no, 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 it's are supported. There? Yep. Okay, so you can get it on some PCs. You can. All right. Um, I think it's $1,000 or thereabouts that they dropped it to, but I may be wrong. I seem to recall that figure. Is there a figure on there? Let me know if you find one. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to move along. Yes. Um, we have a lot to get through. We, we are a college here. We're an educational institution. There's been a big to-do lately with um, funding for educational institutions. Uh, and we've suffered it here at Ramwick TAFE, but also um, most of the uh, universities that teach film and media and those sorts of disciplines, uh, they're striking, they're having big dramas. Yeah, what's this, this, this is this piece about the students yeah. escalating industrial action. On well, it's campus. not so much the students, it, it, they're getting caught in the middle of this because the teachers, the unions, the faculties, um, they're, and this is, everyone's opposed to the budget cuts. They all want more money. What this is about though is the, uh, enterprise bargaining agreements between the faculty, the college and the, the unions and the students and they're trying to get assessments out and made. Uh, they're not getting their assessments on time because of strikes and all this industrial action that's going on. Um, Swinburne University, Deakin University, RMIT, uh, all the results are going to be withheld. Uh, in New South Wales, uh, University of Sydney, they went on strike, they've done it five times now. Deakin University, one hour stop work ahead of bans for overtime for general. So lots of different reasons, sure. but they've all got their issues. Uh, it all comes down to not enough money going to go around, I think. I, well, certainly on this program, we, we believe that education should be funded correctly, if for no other reason than to keep Phil and I in the lifestyle to which we become accustomed, which I've got to tell you isn't terribly no, well I, off. I a better lifestyle than this would be, you know. <laughs> uh, and it is an issue. Our, our college here is currently is okay, but there have been across TAFE, you know, um, bu budget cuts and various departments shutting down. And the universities are also struggling by the look of it too. Just find a way to stay afloat and so, to find an agreement with the unions that everyone can be happy with. Mm. So later on today, Phil and I are going to go and strike this set. Well, I'm striking this set because it's the end of semester and the yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're going on a break Striking soon. as we get on this program. Strike the set. Um, we have, as always, IP issues. Oh. There's a couple of IP stories this week. Warner Brothers, yet again, uh, in the news. Um, now, to be fair, <laughs> they're reacting against some pretty serious pirating of their material. Well, yes, uh, but they're the only ones reacting in quite this way. What happens is, in America, there's a copyright alert system, which all ISPs uh, are participating in, which is, in America, they call it the six strike policy, all right? Warner Brothers have come with a new scheme for those ISPs, the smaller ones, that are not part of this scheme, which includes Charter, CenturyLink, Cox, and other alternative ISPs. Mm. So what they're saying now, they've gone to a company called Digital Rights Corporation, who are monitoring traffic on um, Torrent Freak, on the torrents. And what happens if they notice via your ISP that you are downloading pirated stuff, music and movies, you will receive this notice, quote, your ISP has forwarded you this notice. This is not spam. Your ISP account has been used to download, upload or offer to, for upload copyrighted content in a manner that infringes on the rights of copyright owners. Your ISP service could be suspended if this matter is not resolved. You could be liable for up to $150,000 per infringement in civil penalties. Then they say, if you click on the link below and log in to Rights Corp Inc. Automated Settlement System for $20 per infringement, you will receive a legal release from the copyright owner. So for every song you've downloaded, if you pay $20, you're free and clear. If you've downloaded a heap of stuff, imagine how that's going to add up. It would be your house. <laughs> but 
there is there is much to be said for the rights of the content creator to not have their work ripped off. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm not yeah. supporting piracy in any way. Um, and We'd never support piracy on uh, this oh, show. No, of course not. No. Uh, and we are a show for people who make the content that, you know, the stuff that gets pirated and we don't like that. So, we want to be able to make a living off this. So if you're downloading this show illegally, stop it now! Well, we're not charging for the show. You can oh, download okay. this download the show. You can Send watch and spread this show. Okay. We are not Creative Commons, but you are free to distribute the link for this show. Sorry, my bad. Because I was, I was wrong. Me. It was... Yeah. <laughs> Back to um, however, if you are trying to make money from your content, you know, you don't want people pirating it. This is Warner Brothers' solution for all of those um, smaller ISPs. However, if what, you've got this notice... Pirate there's a there's a pirate. There's one of them there. They send that guy around? Yeah. With a cutlass? No, no, that's the pirate they're after. That's one of the pirates they're after. See, I think he's already done damage to his own leg. You reckon? Yeah, well, you look at that. You know, he's just cut well, it off. Well, they're taking an arm and leg from you after exactly. all. Exactly. $20 per infringement is an arm and a leg if you add it all up. Bad jokes we could do about this. Yes. So many bad jokes. Rice Corp, um, they're apparently also working with BMG Rice Management uh, for David Bowie, Kings of Leon, Will I Am, lots of artists like this. So it's not just movies, it's also music. Uh, Look, it's another way of trying to get... The, but if you saw that notice, if you received that because you downloaded a few things off Torrent Freak, so this, would you not think this was spam? Um, would you, you think, click that you, you link? You think it was pretty strange. <laughs> but this is, this is the notice that goes to the user, not to the ISP. Uh, through the ISP. So that they've got your IP address, I presume, from the ISP, right. and they've noticed that, that your traffic has been Torrent Freak, has been torrenting, and they will... Um, I, I presume, presume send you a notice via email or something. They don't say how here. Mm. You'll get a, a notice seen by Torrance Freak as an accused pirate. You'll get, as a, it comes up as an ad, apparently. Very, very strange. It pops up as an ad. Okay. Um, you see all sorts of weird ads if you go to if you use a torrent, but you know, mm. I think it'll get. I think it's a good try, but I think it'll be ignored. And whether they actually follow up on this, let's find out. Well, speaking of speaking of ignored, um, I've, I've just been going through a very... No more torrent freak until you finish your homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, stop it! <laughs> that's one of those really old PCs, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. a box. That doesn't look like a Mac. It doesn't, no. look, doesn't look like a... a all all modern PCs look meant to look like a, a little mini bin. Yeah, I just, I, I just really love that hemispherical Mac. Mm. You know, whatever. Um, I've been having a really interesting experience with a show that I'm preparing for. And this is a show that's going to run overseas. And there's an awards segment on this show in which uh, there is a, an award for long-form dramatic and a short-form dramatic. Mm. Now, it'll come down to four contenders in, in each class. And as you do at an award show, you say, well, the nominees are one, two, three, four, um, and you show the clip. Yep. You say, you know, the nominee, number one, clip, blah, 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 and nominee number two. Well, we had the experience two years ago where the Ustream of the event... Which you've mentioned, yeah. Yes, just got taken to black. Well, this year we thought we'd get a little bit smarter about this. So we were investigating the process of getting copyright clearance from the studios. You know, much as you were talking about saying, I identified that I had the right to broadcast this material, yeah. therefore they gave me the it's online release. It's a fair release. use, right. And, well, and what is fair use? So in this case, we, we've started investigating. It turns out that the, the studios won't say this officially, I can't say this officially, but the unofficial response is the more you ask us, the more difficult it is going to be for us to say, yes, you can use this yeah. clip. And so just go and do it on the basis of fair use. And what we're getting as an unofficial, not legal, I am not a lawyer opinion is that you're pretty much okay if you go off you and... You forgot to turn your yeah, phone off. Yeah, I forgot to turn you? my phone off. I... <laughs> Except we're not going to go back and reshoot that, are we? Okay. Um, you're pretty much okay if what you use... I would have got away with that if you hadn't said no, anything. No, everyone you know, heard it. <laughs> okay, fine. I know everybody heard it. They all know what it is. You just didn't have to say anything. Because it's so interrupting when you say... I mean, we'd never interrupt this show, would we? And so I what unoffic I'm unofficially. Unofficially. Yeah. So, so well, what they're saying is just go and do it. And yeah. the stuff that you're pretty much able to go and use on the basis of, of fair use is anything that the studios or the rights holders have put up on the web as an ad. So if you find the clip that starts, in a world where blah, 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 so blah you know, yeah. yeah, in a world where Phil Moore is shooting this program every week, <laughs> comes a hero. And it isn't him. So it's kind of like... Um, but you can go and use that. 
if you, if you don't ask and it becomes a problem, just apologise afterwards rather than trying to get permission. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you can assert that you had permission. You yeah. can certainly assert that you asked. Well, this actually leads to our next uh, story, which is uh, the Australian Law Reform Commission are considering they've released a discussion paper that talks about changes to exactly that, to the copyright regime in Australia and the use of fair use, I mean, it, the limitations on fair use. It is up until now very clear um, under the law that fair use, there is an exemption for fair use um, if it's for purposes of study, for review, like reviewing a product, reviewing a movie, um, for satire or for purely personal use. And they are clearly stated exemptions and we can claim fair use as a review. Mm. Um, or for a study even, as an educational show. Oh, we, we, just, we just get it so many ways, you know. Yes. Like uh, but they're considering, changing, they're considering changing this uh, to a more uh, vague description, uh, where copying would be allowed if it meets a general fairness factor. So it's sort of on a one-by-one -one basis. We just have a look at and see if this was a fair use case. Mm. Uh, I think for end users, this is a good idea for people who want to do mashups on YouTube or maybe just, as you say, if they use a bit from a, a movie trailer or something and they have no intention of making money from this, they're doing commentary, doing satire, then under Australian law, if this was be to become law, uh, they're more, they won't get prosecuted. However, the argument here from the Australian Copyright Council is that for content creators, this means they're less likely to make money from people ripping off their stuff, mm. claiming fair use, where they might otherwise be making money from it. Mm. 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 I mean, you can see me looking like this. <laughs> I, I just watched you know, the IINet case and, and thought, you know, where is this going? Where does it get to the point where it's lawyers are 10 yards and, and it's not actually in anybody's interest? Uh, I think the, the case, and YouTube's a good example of, uh, and we've done this a few times, we, we, we show stuff. And every time we show something that is technically someone else's IP, we would say it's a fair use case. And we've been pulled up by YouTube, as many people have, where we get shut down or you get a notice. We got a notice from last week's episode for our little tag Did we really? that we had at the end. Oh. That bit of Monty Python yeah, that we yeah, used. Yeah. Yeah. And I acknowledged that it's their copyright. And the owners of that copyright said, fine, we're not going to do anything about it. We're, we're not going to shut you down or place ads. We'll just leave it alone. Right. And they, that's, that was their choice. Um, I think that's a pretty good practice where if it gets flagged you can, and you own this content, you can say, that's fine, it's obviously an education, it's obviously satire, I'm not going to worry about it. If you're Warners or Sony or someone like that, you might be very heavy handed about it, or Disney, very heavy handed about do, it. Do you think there's any danger that that piece of Python that was at the end of last week's episode is going to drive up our ratings at all? I think a few people who haven't watched it yet will watch it now. Certainly, and go could. and look at last week's episode and watch it and, through and to the very here's, end. Here's, <laughs> the, here's the tip: at the end of every episode, just have a look at the time. Like, if it's still thirty seconds to go at the end of the credits, there's an Easter egg. There's, yeah, if it, if it yeah. just goes black for a while, uh, stay tuned. Not that we give away the secret at all. No. Um, Moving on to other business. Uh, a whole I love the way you say that. Yeah. Moving on to moving other right business. Along. Moving right along. Moving right along. That's your, um, you know, like we're moving right along. We're moving right along. Right along. Um, a horror movie, The Purge, uh, made for $3 million. As of this writing, uh, it opened to $36 million. So it's already made 10 times its budget back in the first week. And isn't that great for those people? So every year or so, we get uh, a little cheap indie, usually a horror film. So like this year's Blair Witch. Exactly, yeah. and um, uh, what was the other one recently? Um, paranormal Par Activity. Paranormal and all activity. Of those it was up to like Paranormal Activity and saw, 5 or something. Exactly, so, and so there's an article here on therap.com, which we're just looking at, which says, well, if so many films tend to do this, why aren't the big studios making more little $3 million films that could make a really decent profit on the, based on their budget? Um, but surely, fairly. surely that's nobody knows that they're going to make a profit on a three million dollar film just because it's a three million dollar film. There are plenty of like one million dollar, half million dollar films that go nowhere. Yeah, but for every three hundred million dollar film you make, you can make a hundred of these, and surely twenty of them would hit. Uh, there is there is some logic in that. Yes. Uh, well, the argument in this article says yes, you could do that, but bear in mind that these movies are pretty much almost always genre films, horror or thriller. Oh, um, that is. There are so many low-budget films that get made that never see the light of day. And if you want to see a film of Les Miserables, you don't do that on $3 million, clearly. 
there's some films you just cannot do on a $3 million budget. No, that would have been pretty difficult. No, $3 million basically determines the kind of film you can make at that budget level. I wonder if you can make a decent chick flick for like 150 k 150k. Well, you don't. Well, thousand. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was, you know, pushing the price down. Let's push the envelope. If you didn't pay anyone, yes. Yeah. Well, then you can make <laughs> huge profits. Okay, that looks a bit like a chick flick, except it was actually. We're, we're talking, and yet, look, you can make a film for that money or even less. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about a film that actually everyone gets paid award wage at the very least, mm. and it's all all above board, three million is a minimum for doing anything seriously. It, like, that's a starting point. Once, once you've got the, the three crew on the stage and the yeah. award rates. Unless you're like, <laughs> literally, <laughs> three actors, Wish. three people in the crew, yeah. and you don't pay yourself much, it's really small, can, can take, you can do take it, it all you know. back. Uh, three million is like a starting price these days for an average low budget, but properly done uh, film. Mm. Uh, anyway, there's a good article there on the wrap about uh, those kind of low budget films. But if we're talking big budget films, most of them, most of the ones, like the new Star Wars by J.J. Abrams, that's mm. going to be going in production soon, they're being shot in London of all places. All of these big films are being shot in London and post-produced in London. This is just like, it, it moves around. Um, this, last week it was Hollywood, this week it's Sydney, next week it's London. Yeah, and so they, they're just going wherever it is cheaper at the time. Wherever the big incentives are. It's been Canada, it's been Australia. Um, and now it's London, they're offering the best incentives. Which, which really says something to a, a, you know, a government or a regulator, which is you can buy the attention of the industry, make it inexpensive for them to go and produce well, where you are. That's the gist of this article from The Wrap, in fact, that they, they say this, but then they say, why isn't Car um, um, California doing this? Why aren't they offering decent tax incentives in Hollywood to keep productions being shot in California. See, I would have thought, I would have thought Hollywood be, would be the last place where they'd be offering incentives on, on the basis that the whole system is free enterprise. Everything is geared to people failing. Well, you could say all of the whole, you know, industrial machine of America is free enterprise based. And it's all geared to people but failing. So is, it, so is it here in Australia? So is it in London, yeah. after all? Yeah. Uh, we're not that different in terms just, of how our finances work. In London, you just get a better class of failure. Uh, but <laughs> yes, and London's notoriously one of the most expensive cities in the world to be to live, and yet it's turning out to be one of the cheapest places currently to actually make a big film. Which actually means they're not living on fish and chips because fish and chips in London is about as expensive as anywhere. Well, they say here the rewards for London is um, between twenty to twenty-five percent of the money is spent in the UK. Uh, you get refunded uh, depending on the size of the production budget. Uh, anyway, so all these big films are moving to the UK. They said the same about Australia, they said the same about Canada, about Mexico. They're mm. trying to keep production in the US. But the one good thing about the Mac Pro, which I didn't mention, is they're claiming that it is, is um, uh, not, it's built in the US. Uh, past come from overseas, but it's being built in the US. So that's, for the Americans, that's a good deal. So the money's not going overseas. Exactly. There you go. Um, we'll just to finish up, we have here a story from um, the Writers Guild of America. Uh, 101 greatest screenplays. And frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I don't think that's even on the list. Really? Gone with the Wind. Uh, let me just check here. Oh, yes, it is. Sorry, it's number 23. Number 23. Number 23. What would you think would be top of the list of the best screenplay ever written in the opinion of the Writers Guild of America? <gasps> it's, you know, that's so hard. It is not going to be Star Wars. We know it's not Star no, Wars. No, but it is, Any it is them, on the list. It's not, it's not going to be a trek. I would have Star a guess. Star Wars is number 68. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a guess and say... Um, Casablanca. Yes. Serious. Casablanca, number one, best ever screenplay. Number two, Godfather, the first. Mm. Um, and the second one's a bit further down. Chinatown, Citizen Kane, All About Leave. I won't go through those. I've seen, I'm proud to say, I've seen all of these films. I know all of these 101 films, and they are all well-deserved. You've well seen them all personally? I have. I've seen all of these. I know all of these films. Um, How old was Orson Welles when he made Citizen Kane? He was, like, in his 20s. Yeah, he 20. Yeah, four or something. Amazing I think. piece of work. Anyway, that's a really good list. Have a look on wga.org uh, for the 101 greatest screenplays. Nice list. Um, that's the news for this week. I think it's time we jump straight into our tutorial for this week, our latest with Carol Seegers on screenwriting.
Hello, welcome to the fifth in our instalment on screenwriting with Karel Seegers. Hello, Karel. Hello, Phil. Now, we've talked about um, characters having goals and the importance of action for a character. Uh, let's talk a bit more specifically about what our character is, the, the main character, our protagonist in a story. Mm -hmm. um, what is a protagonist, really? Yeah, that, that sounds like such a simple question, doesn't it? And it isn't, you know? Um, and there's so many names for it. So mm. Sid Field doesn't like the word protagonist. He said, <laughs> why do you use protagonist? You've got main character, that's just, that's good enough. Well, you know, you've got main character, you've got protagonist, you've got hero, mm. you've got point of view character, and, and most of the time they're all the same. Sometimes they're not, and that's where it gets really difficult. So how do you, what is the main character? Well, I always, I always say, you know, how ultimately, you know? what does the audience say? You know, how does the audience answer the question, who is it about? Hmm? And if there's disagreement in the audience about who's the bad, that's interesting. So maybe there the screenwriter hasn't done the job properly. Because right? there are films that have a very clear main protagonist. I mean, one of the common examples is like Die Hard, for example. Mm -hmm. It's obviously about the Bruce Willis character. Yeah. Uh, but there's ensemble pieces, and it's mm -hmm. hard to know who is your main character. Yeah. Is there a main character? I Should wouldn't even, be? I wouldn't even talk about ensemble because it's such a small percentage of films that are successful. I'm serious, it's only like one or two percent. And, and still, screenwriters still want to write multi-protagonist stories. But really look at it, two percent of the, of the successful films only have ensemble. And that's, you know, out of those that get made, there's still, you know, every year, 50,000 well, that don't get let, let me bring up, to play devil's advocate, last episode we talked about The Avengers, very successful film. It's an ensemble piece. There's multiple principal characters, each with their own film franchise. Mm -hmm. Who's the central character of that? Yeah, ultimately I'd say it's um, Iron Man. I think Iron Man plays the main role in terms of, he makes the, the, the most important decision. I need to analyse it. I haven't analysed the film, but just off the top of my head, I'd say it's, uh, it's, oh, I, it's Robert Downey Jr. I'd have, well, I'd have to agree with you, mainly because, not because of who the star is, but because of how the film ends yeah. and the role he plays yeah. in that climax. And that's really a very good test. Mm. And I had the discussion with students uh, only last week. Uh, if, if you're not sure who's the main character, look at the ending of your film. Look at who, who, takes, who makes the final decision, who takes a, a, the, the climactic action. And that's usually the character that should then be the main character from the beginning. Mm. If it isn't, maybe you need to do some, uh, uh, you yeah, know. One, one good there. example of this I remember was uh, the original Blob with Steve McQueen, who is technically meant to be the main character, but he's not making most of the key decisions mm -hmm. throughout the film. Yeah. He's letting other people do it. So he's a very weak main yeah. character as a result, yeah. would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Now, often you have two characters, like, you know, Finding Nemo or Thumb and Louise or the Shawshank Redemption. And then we look at which is the character who changes and does the character change because of their own actions or because of another character's actions. And in the Shawshank Redemption, it's clear that um, uh, Red, played by Morgan Freeman, changes because of the actions of uh, Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins. So but you, you don't really look at those issues because once, once you start pulling them apart and there's several characters who are both vying for that main character uh, role, it becomes very problematic. So even in a buddy flick where you've got two very strong protagonists working together, one tends to be the main one, yeah. even so. Yeah, and, and, and as you say, the key uh, criteria are the, the ending, the, the f final action, the climactic choice, and um, the goals. Whose main goal pushes the story forward? And that's another, another indicator. Sometimes you have a main character who's very passive, and he's observing in the background, Animal Kingdom. In Animal Kingdom, Jay, he's just looking at this family, you know, falling mm -hmm. apart or, you know, imploding. Uh, and then he does an action in the third act, which proves him to be the main character. Before that, he's just a point of view character. Right. You can, uh, you can argue that Ben Mendel Mendelsohn is really the main character, but then he's the antagonist. So we, we, we don't believe that an antagonist can be a main character. Is it possible to switch your main character halfway through a story? Um, well, Alfred Hitchcock did that uh, once. Well, yeah. famously, in yeah. Psycho, yes. Yeah. But there, I think it was a gimmick that was so that had this shock value. I'd say don't, you know, um, don't try this at home. No. And what, what about something like, again, I'm thinking Lord of the Rings, where Sam ends up, he's not really the main character, Frodo's the main character, certainly in the films rather than the books. But he takes a very proactive role 
uh, you know, later in the story. Yeah. And he's almost becoming the main character for that part of the story. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and um, you know, with, with properties like Lord of the Rings, you get away with it. Mm. Um, we see something like Inception, where also the Ariadne character, Emma Page, at some stage kind of takes over. We see the whole story through her eyes. We learn about the world through her eyes. And we, we kind of look from a distance at the Don Cobb, the Leonardo DiCaprio character. And then later we go back to him. Um, so it is possible to switch main characters, but it's not advisable. I know, and I think <laughs> even in a movie that was successful, like Inception, I think it still leaves us cold in terms of that main character. And I think uh, it's probably one of the reasons why Inception may have been a very uh, successful film at the time. I don't think it's going to survive as a classic. I don't think it will. No? No, I don't think so. Um, what about supporting characters then? Because very often, if you have a very clearly defined main character, uh, very often they're defined by the people around them, yeah. by the supporting cast, by yeah. the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the, the boss, whoever it might be. Yeah. And they help you decide who that central, whose journey you're actually going to follow. Now we're, now we're entering really interesting territory, Phil, because you know why this is? It's because every story is about you, Phil Moore. Every story is about the viewer. Every story is about our own psychology and we project who we are on all the characters around us. And, and that's obviously, the, the, the story is the metaphor. The story tells our story on the screen, our own story, our own conflicts. And in order to make it you know, interesting and to express it, to explain to a degree what's going on in our minds, all these different characters that we have in our, in our heads are projected onto different supporting characters. And that's why the stories of these supporting characters all need to intersect with the main character. They've got to have to do something with the main character. Mm. And that's where archetypes come in. You know, Carl Jung did a lot of work in that, um, uh, Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey. Yeah. Uh, so all these supporting characters play a certain role, the mentor, the herald, you know, the, the messenger, um, the lover. Which is all part of the hero's journey, those archetypes. And they're yeah. all part of the hero himself or herself. Mm. And it gives us someone to relate to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Carol Seegers, thank you very much. Pleasure. See you next time in our continuing series on screenwriting with Carol Seegers. So we have a few more of those tutorials with Carol Seegers coming up. Watch out for those in future episodes. Uh, but right now, as mentioned, this is a class by our diploma class, and I have with me now three of our students, in fact, Iona, Masood, and Jing. Hi. So these are our students, three of the students from our class. What we're going to show for you right now is some, uh, a bit of a montage that you and our other producer for this episode, um, Naomi, put together of some of the documentaries that you made last semester, last semester yeah. at the beginning of yeah. diploma. So let's run that now and have a look at it. Um, we went, I was at a party at Bridget's house mm -hmm. and we had a few drinks and decided it'd be good to start a band. Yeah. And so that's how we, that's how we first started. I thought it'd be good to get Josh to come and play drums. What's yours? We've got our own. Basically, you're looking for a drummer now, right? Well, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah so, what, like, how did it come around that the drummer ended up leaving? Is, was it. Uh, it was kind of a mutual thing at the end, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of kind of lack of communication on, I guess, both parts, but it's just really hard. Fonua placenta, buried in the by me dreaming of the Eora Nation, Sydney, Australia, nourishes my belonging to this land with my ancestral roots embedded in my island nation, the Kingdom of Tonga. Hafisi, Mohamoa, and Hahavea are the clans I spawn from. They guide my existence. I call her the Xena of the South Pacific because she's very much a fighter um, and a creator in her own right. Sideshow was a collaboration between Kathy Kogel and I, um, commissioned by Campbelltown Arts Centre, to make an intercultural dance work. Sideshow is comments on Australian identity and how we otherise 
those who don't fall into the dominant notion of what is Australian. I remember I was young at high school, again, problems with um, official things, losing identifications, um, and then being the third level citizen of the country was pain. I didn't have right to study, to work. I didn't have right even to get married. And then I had trouble with the government. As the Democratic Kurdistan, Throughout time, in cultures all over the world, humans have found a way to decorate their body. The clean naked skin that we were born with has not been beautiful enough. Feathers, pearls, colours, and of course tattoos. Today, fresh ink can be seen anywhere. These permanent designs might be elaborate or simple, but they are always personal. It's an art form that has told and will keep telling us some amazing stories. Because let's face it, tattoos are not meant to be hidden. I'm Richard Seddon and I'm the project director for the Australian Tattoo and Body Art Expos. So there's some examples of uh, some documentaries that our students made uh, last semester. Uh, among them, these three on the couch here with me. Uh, you actually produced one of those, the, the one in the middle, uh, what was it called? Body of Art. Body of Art yeah. with the dancer. Masood, we saw you in yours. Yeah, The Longest Journey. Yes, The Longest Journey. Um, and Jing, which, what was your involvement in those ones that we saw there? Any? Oh, are you of the, uh, the Longest Journey? The, part of the longest journey yeah, one as well, yeah. okay. Um, at, at this college we, we teach drama production, so we're making short films, but we also do focus on documentary sometimes, as you can see there. Uh, and that's just a sampling of the films that we've made. Um, you also particularly want to talk about, and I want to talk about, uh, the fact that we're training you to do documentaries. We had Peter DeVries here last week, obviously, talking about as a documentary cinematographer. Mm. Uh, and yours, Masood, in particular, I mean, given the nature of that story, uh, having to deal with that, and I haven't seen the whole thing, I must admit, but uh, I think that actually speaks to how important documentaries can be in our culture and uh, in, in showing other cultures and that, that kind of situation. Um, what was it like for you, uh, that experience? Uh, that was my life experience, actually. So uh, that was very interesting, and I was very grateful that I had an opportunity to tell about um, my own story, my life story. The truth is some people don't know about it. So I could uh, bring it to the screen to show it to people. Right. Um, there's one other, there's a documentary in particular that you guys saw, I think it was last year you saw it in fact, um, called Free China, yeah, which speaks to this kind of thing as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. because they are uh, we have the opportunity to watch it uh, in a private pre screen in Sydney. Mm. So uh, I think it's very powerful to send message, send information about people don't know. So that's why, um, because last uh, last week it's a re it, it was released. So uh, it was released yeah. in America this, this yes, last yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. So and I it's won a few awards, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have the trailer for that lined up? Let's have a quick look at what we're talking about here. Free China. Um, what's the subtitle on that? I've got to see it there. The Courage to the Believe. Courage. Uh, do we have the trailer for that? Let's play that. I did not have a, a thought that I would die. Even if I would die, then I, I wouldn't be afraid of dying. 
It was about two o'clock in the morning when the police came to me and took me away. I was arrested at the airport, so I knew something bad would happen. Do you know you will get arrested sooner or later? And I said, why? Then he answered very seriously because of your thought. Truthfulness, compassion, forbearance. They were taking this very seriously. This is an authoritarian state. Things like this don't happen. With courage to believe. Faith gives people the backbone to withstand unbelievable waves of repression. I closed my eyes and my son tried to sum up all my will. This is exactly what I was forced to make, Homer Simpson slippers. It wasn't an examination to show their health, it was an examination to see whether their organs were good. Okay, so um, you, you guys saw this film late last year. Uh, and the reason I wanted to highlight this is because, you know, um, uh, documentaries can have such an important cultural effect, but also as a school and, and as an audience for filmmakers, um, I gather uh, the people who made this film, there were some challenges that they faced, you, uh, you saw in the making of this film, yes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was interesting for us because we went up to watch it while we were shooting our own documentaries. So we wanted to, you know, see, like we thought he'd be out there, you know, probably giving a talk during the screening. He wasn't there, but yeah, it was interesting to see that, um, I mean, some of the obstacles that you'd have to face to get a story because, you know, this is unscripted. Whatever so happens, what, happens. So. What's it basically about there? I mean, we saw some of the trailer, of course, but just briefly, what was the whole film about? I guess it was about a, um, a practice. It was a, yeah. like a like recreational practice. It's called it's Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a, a practice, uh, the med uh, meditation practice. Mm. It's called Falun Gong. It's based in uh, traditional Chinese culture. So it's uh, uh, because one the people practice Falun Gong in China and uh, peop, uh, Chinese government can uh, uh, persecute uh, persecuted them. So that's why lots of people they lose life uh, in the uh, jail uh, in the jail in pre uh, prison. Mm, so this was a big big story a few years ago yeah. of yeah. the crackdown on the Falun Gong. Yeah, yes. it's about uh, uh, forty years. Right. And they've been fighting, I think, ever since, because Chinese government actually promoted this meditation practice, mm. and then it, it kind of saw that it had a big following, yeah. and then it felt threatened, so decided to go against it, and then they started putting people in prisons and trying to re-educate, reprogram their mind, pretty much. Right. So, um, in watching this film, though, uh, you, you said to me earlier you were noticing that. Um, it didn't look like the filmmakers had any access no. uh, into China, into uh, the people that were involved in this directly. Well, they they couldn't. It didn't seem like they filmed in China. Nothing fresh. It was all a lot of file footage, and that the people that they interviewed on the documentary um, were actually living overseas. Well, this is of interest to us because we're actually considering. We had a trip to New York last year with some of our students, and we're considering a trip to China. Yeah. Um, later this year. Yeah, if you want, to, if you are going <laughs> to China, you to should film? know some rules. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, I've got to get up on what we're allowed to film and what we're not allowed yeah, to exactly. film exactly with, with the Chinese government. Uh, but yeah. I think it also highlights the fact that uh, uh, whatever doc subject you choose for your documentary, and yours, my suit, was a really good example from what we saw there. Um, these are important personal stories, and they show us other cultures. They show us what things can be like in the rest of the world. Um, any of you have ambitions to go on making more documentaries? Of course. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yes? I think, yes, of course. Yeah, because, uh, we, I think we, us on we the are couch are uh, looking towards documentary <laughs> yeah. making, but everyone yeah, else... Because I think, I think <laughs> the most of documentary is very difficult to go back to the current scene. So we want to use a different way to show uh, audience how to uh, get in the uh, other story. Mm. Yeah, so that's why I learned from lots of from this uh, documentary. So I think it's I can share with us. Uh, I share with others, and uh, uh, like I I review my life. I think 
it's very important to the good job is important the make money is, is is important but i think uh I can do something for the others. I think it's the most important. Well, you have, uh, have a noble... Telling other people's stories. Yeah. Telling other people's stories to get that out there and hopefully yeah. help others that, that, that don't go through the same thing. Yeah. Good on you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, and this being the end of semester, this is, this is actually your last class for this yeah. semester. Some of you, are, I think you're all going on to advanced diploma. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this will be possibly the last time we'll see you with us here in this class. Hence the streamers, hence our mm. mirror ball yeah. and everything else. Yeah, it's party time. <laughs> it's party time. It's almost party time. But yeah. we've got one more thing before we wrap up this show and we're going to do, we've got one pick my brain question. Let's run that now. Pick my brain. And we have um, an email pick my brain question here from Jim. When using three different cameras, for instance, a P2, a DSLR and a GoPro, how should we set all the cameras to shoot similar visually in order to have a coherent edit? That, and that's, and that's, you know, that is the classic, classic problem that you have with any rig, which is you are just as likely to have different bits of equipment trying to do the same job mm. as you are to have the same or bits of equipment. Or different cameras on different days for different, because that's what you've got available. And magically, John has joined me on the couch here. Yeah, <laughs> what is it amazing? Look, look, just whoosh, and all those whoosh, people suddenly vanish. Uh, let, let me really first television. address the, the similarities you're going to get, uh, so the differences yeah. you're going to get. Um, they will all have a different depth of field based on the size of the chip and the lens, which we talked about last week with Pete DeVries. And they're also going to have a different colour balance just on, based on, again, the chip, the lens, the circuitry, um, and how they're compressed and everything else. Um, they're possibly going to use the same codec, H.264, although the well, P2 may not. They might not. They might not. Um, Are we talking about all the things that will lead to different, different looks? Differences. Uh, you should be able to set them, and these ones in particular, let's say P2 and a, a, a 5D, for example, uh, to... Uh, 720p or 1080p, so set them to all the same resolution. If they can all be progressive scan, that would be great. If one's interlaced, well, such, so be it, you're stuck with the interlaced. But try to set them to all the same resolution, and um, if you can. Mm. Um, if you can't control the codec, set it to the highest bit rate, so the least amount of compression. You'll end up with a larger file, but you'll get a better quality image, as much as every camera is different in that respect. Uh, that's as much as you can do with the cameras. They're going to look different no matter what you well, do. Well, I mean, you, you've covered a lot of the, the really important points. So if you distill what it is that Phil said, the first thing you want to do with all of these devices is normalise them. Get mm. them down to some common baseline where you can then spot the differences. So, yes, if you can get them all running on the same codec, if you can get them running at the same line and frame rate and, and, and frame all, rate, absolutely. all progressive, yes, you yeah. certainly don't want, to be, <laughs> don't want to be intercutting like 60i with 25 or 24p because you know, yeah. it will lead to tears. And this is not to say you can't do that. Of course you can do it but you will get different looks. And, and, and it can be hard. On the P2s, for example, it's sometimes hard to know if they're recording at 25 or 50 frames, depending on the codec and the, the setting you choose. It's a bit unclear in look, some of these cameras. You, you even find that when you're working in a studio, you will find that three identical cameras will, for some reason, two of them will come in one f resolution and the other one will just refuse to switch, no matter how many times you, mm. you play with the menus. Now, yeah. Um, you can, all, all, if there are differences, you can adjust that in post. One thing I would recommend, if at all possible, is to record at 24p these days, if the camera supports it. Um, and why would, you do, why would you do that? I would do that because most of what you're going, your end result is going to end up on a Blu-ray disc. You're shooting in HD after all. Go to Blu-ray disc or online. Mm. Um, and if you do go to cinema, like a DSLR, um, um, uh, sorry, a, a digital cinema, they insist on 24 frames a second. Changing it from 25 to 24 or 30 to 24 can be problematic. Uh, if you can shoot 24 and, and as 24... You will, get, you will get some sort of artefact created by you the conversion. You can, you will. It, it'll yeah. do it. You can do it in your editing, but you'll end up having to add or drop frames. Exactly. Um, and so 24 is a better standard to work with these days. 25 is fine if you're going to go to television, and it is the standard in Australia after all. If you can't choose 24, then choose 25 across the board. Mm. That said, if you bring it into Premiere Pro or any other or Media Composer, it doesn't matter if they're different resolutions. It doesn't matter if they're different frame rates even. 
it'll yeah. it'll make it Look, work. Pe people say that you, you can you, you can fix a lot of things in post, but the the reality is that whatever you go into post with is what was captured. Nothing you do in post is going to make it any better. It no. can only make it worse, worse. And your best your best outcome is when you've done all the work before you get into post, so that you've got you've got the best resolution you can get and you need to deal with, and you've got the colorimetry right, and you've got the exposures right. No, I agree. Um, you recorded the best resolution you can. When I say uh, it doesn't matter in post, what I mean is you can still edit uh, yeah. footage that is different. Yes, of course you can. But if you can match it up as best you can up front, and if you do have different footage, uh, let's say you shot most of your production on the P2, then set your project up for that resolution for the P2 at full HD um, using DVC Pro or whatever codec you used, mm. and then make the rest of it match to that. Um, if you shot most of it on the 5D, then start with the 5D footage and get the rest to match to that. Yeah. Use whichever camera you use the most, which is your prime camera for whatever the shoot was. By the way, there are some things that you can do if you know you're heading into a situation where the gear is going to be different. So, like, you've planned the shoot and you know that all you can get is an F55 and a GoPro <laughs> and a 5D. So you know that's what you're going in with. Well, what sort of things are they going, going to do? Ignoring the differences that you might get in terms of depth of field and how the sensors behave, because you can make artistic decisions around that, and you can change your lenses, and you can, and you can, and you can. Mm. But there are some things then that are going to look bad if they are wrong. With colorimetry, it is going to be difficult to get exact colour matches on everything if you have different hardware. Well, cheat. Make sure you're shooting stuff that doesn't have dramatic hard differences of colour, for example, and don't let any of your talent wear sort of really bright, blocky colours, especially reds and purples, which just look vile if they're not matched between shots. Yeah, on a, on a lesser camera like the GoPro, arguably, that becomes a big issue. Low light becomes a big issue. Yeah. Um, if you're going to use these cameras in very different scenes yeah. and it doesn't matter that they look a bit different, that's better. You're best not to use two separate cameras on the same scene. Um, but you will have to tweak the colour grading in post to get them to match if you're trying to get them to you match. Might, you might also make use of the fact, for instance, if you've got one, yes. one camera that performs really well in low light and one that is just disgusting and it's all noise, actually use the noisy camera as part of the shot yeah. to indicate something different about the scene. You know, and you, you can use... The, like enhanced and over-the-shoulder shots. Yeah, the GoPro will be for your action shots and they're going to look a bit different. So make, make, a, yeah. make a point make of Make a it. feature of it. Yeah, and you know, I, I used the DV camera in my last film for underwater stuff because that's all we could get and I said fine it's going to look grungy and stand to death compared to the HD footage but fine it's, it's kind of actually plus sequence. you know it's a cheaper camera when you use it underwater without the housing well <laughs> yes <laughs> didn't last long it had a housing <laughs> <laughs> you spoil it Phil. you spoil it but it was stand to death underwater compared to you know the HD but yeah. that's fine it was it gave it a grungier look for those moments which was which was good yeah. so turn it to your advantage mm. um, yeah but normalize the cameras as best you can you're not going to be able to do a perfect job uh, the rest, you kind of fix it in post. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's it. That's the end of this show. It's the end of the semester. It's the end of A Girl and a Gun Series 1 for the moment. In future episodes, uh, we've got part two of our David Hanna interview coming up. We have another special interview with um, um, art, um, uh, concept artist Mike Worrell. We also have big things planned for um, The Simpty Show, which is coming up in a few weeks' time. We're hoping to do an episode at the Simpty Show and do a big walk of the, um, of the floor and all the exhibitors there. So look forward to those in the next few weeks. However, our regular show will be on a holiday break for the next few weeks. Uh, and we will start in, a, in, in um, August or so with a brand new group of students. Um, with lots of mistakes, no doubt. Oh, yeah, but it's so much fun. Mm. So, look, we, we spent so much time talking about food on this show. Yes. Yeah. What have I you just got went out. Well, I couldn't get a curried egg sandwich, but <laughs> that's a wrap. That's a wrap.